the 55th annual ISNA convention. In God we trust. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sisters and brothers, I want to talk to you today about trust, about trust in Allah. I, I love the theme of today's evening of today, of, of, this, of this year's entire conference, In God We Trust. And I think it's such an important theme because even though it was only voted as the motto of our country in the 1950s as a response to the godless Soviet Union, in this theme, if we were to truly invest in it, if we were to truly implement it, in our lives, in our communities, in our families, and in our country, in God we trust, we would transform our lives. It, we would transform our families, and we would transform our communities, and we would transform this country. I want to talk to you about what it looks like, according to the Quran, when we implement this principle in our lives. So many of us are suffering. So many of us are suffering. And because of the nature of our community's general cu culture, there's a stigma around suffering. We all want to present a very strong face. And so we sit in halls larger than this with other Muslims. And if we are struggling in our lives, we feel alone. We feel like we're the only ones in this hall who are dealing with X, Y problem. I know I have felt that way. When I've been going through a hard time in my life and I sit in these kinds of halls and I look around and I feel like I'm completely alone. And so, so many of us are suffering. We feel anxious, we feel afraid for the future. We feel regretful about the past. And in that, in that moment, in that experience of isolation and suffering for so many different reasons, so maybe you're dealing with a financial problem in your life or an issue with your family or something going on at work or you're having problems with your spouse. We feel like we're in the middle of a storm. And we don't know how to control the outside environment. We don't know what to do. And so the natural human inclination in this storm, in this uncertainty called life, is we want to assert control. And it's, it's, it's completely understandable. Because control kind of sells itself as the mitigation of uncertainty. If we can just assert control on this situation, we wouldn't feel so anxious. We wouldn't feel so afraid. If we can just assert some control, we would have security. And so we're in this position of this huge storm and we just want to find a way to control the situation. And it reminded me of the, the scene that is painted so vividly in the Quran, of when Nuh alayhi salam is on the boat with just a handful of believers that he got to believe in him and, and get on this boat with him, and it describes the waves as big as mountains. And they're in this boat and they're being thrown around everywhere. And he says to his son, come, come join us on the boat. And his son responds with what I think so many of us would have perhaps said in that moment, which is, no, 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 that boat looks so scary, insecure, unreliable, in, the, in this huge storm with, with waves as big as mountains, I'm going to go over there and find my safety on the mountain. 
And so you see this choice between the seductive stability of the mountain and then this boat in the middle of a stormy sea. And his father is calling to him. And as soon as he says that, a wave comes and washes him into the water. And that mountain is our attempt at control. And that boat is what it looks like to trust in God. That boat is the boat of tawakkul. And that mountain is the seductive allure, the siren call of control. Because it looks so stable. It looks so immovable. It looks so reliable if I can just control the situation. And this is on so many levels, on a personal level, on a community level, and even on a national level. Now, on this boat, I want to I make this clear. It's not always comfortable. You know, these folks, these believers, this handful of people that were with Nuh on this boat, and my husband just pointed this out, how did they feel when they first got on that boat in the first few minutes? Maybe they looked at that mountain and wondered, hey, you know, maybe that was a better choice. We're being thrown around by waves in this boat. It feels uncomfortable. It's not always, it's not a cruise ship. It's not a spa vacation when we're trusting in God in the middle of that storm. It can be really scary. But then there are examples where it looks like a calm sea in the middle of a storm. When the Prophet ﷺ was with Abu Bakr in Ghar Thawr, he was being pursued by people with a bounty on his head that would be worth more than you know, millions of dollars today, in today's money. And, and they could see their feet. They were right there. And he looked over and he could sense that Abu Bakr, with all his faith, he, he could sense his fear. And his response to him with this, with this certain sense of calm, his trust in God was so deep. He said, what is your opinion of two whose third is Allah? Sometimes trust in God does look like a calm sea. Trust in Allah on the personal level, whether we have that depth of being able to be calm in the middle of a storm or, or it does feel uncomfortable and rickety and, and hard and unstable, either way, it liberates us. Trusting in God liberates us because we have actually put our faith in the only thing that has any influence over the outcome. You see, the seductive lure of control is so damaging and so toxic because it is a lie. We have no control. We have no control. We cannot control our children. Anyone who has kids in this room totally knows that. We cannot control anyone else. Control as a way to deal with complexity brings about toxicity. So trusting in Allah liberates us from this delusion. But what is so amazing about this idea of trusting in Allah is it helps communities and even nations when it's actually implemented. One thing I was really struck by is in the Quran, when Allah is addressing the Prophet والسلام, after a tragic and, and very difficult defeat at Uhud, he tells him, to forgive, to ask for the forgiveness of his people, 
who made so many mistakes during that battle, and to continue to consult with them, and then to trust in God. Trust in God on a communal level allows us to take risks, allows us the space to do things different from the way we've always done them. It gives us safety. It allows us the, the space to take risks, to make progress. Because if you aren't allowed to make a single mistake, you'll never do anything differently. And if you can't do anything differently, you'll never progress. You know, it was really interesting. I read a study that Google conducted on their own work teams. Google is like a country, practically, 100,000 employees, right? It's a small city. And they did a study on their work teams looking at the most productive work teams and what those, pro and what those work teams had in common and how they were different from everyone else. And they looked at all kinds of variables from demographics to years of experience to education. And they found that none of those things mattered. What distinguished the most productive work teams at Google from the rest was emotional safety. The ability to make mistakes without those mistakes being the end of the world. Having managers and having leaders that would give you a second chance. And the Quran teaches us that that space is provided for and, and our example for leadership, the Prophet والسلام, was instructed by our Creator to allow mistakes, to give people a second chance, even when they make huge mistakes, and to trust in God. Trust in God gives us space to make mistakes on a communal level. Now, what does it tell us about how we should treat people outside of our community? There are two instances, at least, that I thought were really striking. The first is an ayah that we all are familiar with, la ikraha fi din. And if you read that entire ayah, what you find, interestingly, is the idea that, you know, there is no compulsion in religion because truth is made clear from falsehood. So anyone who leaves falsehood and is holding on the only trustworthy handhold of Allah is the one that is rightly, rightly guided. When we trust in Allah, when we trust in God, we don't force ourselves, we don't force our beliefs on others. Freedom of conscience is enshrined in our scripture. And a part of that, a, a foundation of this principle is the trust in Allah. If we truly trusted in Allah and if we truly trusted in his self-evident truth, we would have no reason to force it. It is too precious to be forced. It is too perfect to need our feeble, fallible human intervention. It can stand on its own. It does not need us. We need it. So trust in God gives people freedom. It gives people freedom of conscience. It gives people the freedom to choose. Because it gives us the confidence in what we believe. Because forcing things on others is from a place of weakness, not from a place of strength. Trust in God gives believers the confidence to never force their thoughts on others. And the last way that I found where trust in God made such a difference in the way 
that societies were organized. It's a very interesting ayah where the Prophet ﷺ was told, there are people, basically describing the hypocrites, that in your face they're saying, oh yes, we believe you and we believe in you and everything you're saying is wonderful, but behind your back at night they are plotting against you. They're plotting against you. And this is something that Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ, who was a head of state. So he has not intelligence, but divine intelligence that there are plots being hatched against him and against the state. And then he is told to turn away from them, meaning not to punish them, and to trust in God. Have you ever thought about Medina and why it did not turn into a police state? I mean, it's kind of a strange question, but think about it. Think about the conditions of Medina and then imagine it in the modern world and then tell me how a head of state would behave, whoever he is or she. You have a very charismatic head of state with very loving, loyal followers who believe that he is getting revelation from God. Are they going to obey anything he says? Yes. You have an actual existential threat to that state, not an imagined one, but a real one, of people wanting to destroy this entity, wanting to wipe this entity off the face of the earth. And then you have people on the inside plotting against this state. And the head of state knows this for an absolute certainty because he's actually getting this information from God. Imagine this reality today. What kind of draconian laws would be implemented in this kind of a place before anyone did anything? I'm talking about minority report type laws where you get arrested before you've done something, pre-crime. Have you ever wondered why that never happened in Medina? Why was Medina not a police state? Because we have an example of a leader who internalized and actually implemented this idea of in God we trust. In God we trust protects civil liberties. In God we trust gives people freedom. In God we trust protects due process. There is no pre-crime. You cannot arrest somebody before they've done anything. So in our lives, when we have storms that we are going through, times of uncertainty, times of great fear, and we have that choice between the stability of control on that mountain and that shaky, rickety boat of trust in Allah. Let us all choose the boat. Thank you. The 55th Annual ISNA Convention. In God We Trust.